um, asked me, he says, sometime I would like, like you to prepare a lesson in this, in this vein of what I've just done today. It took me a little bit. And uh, it's through a lot of thought and, and, uh, and time and putting together that I've finally come up with something. Uh, I'm hoping it will be beneficial to you. Uh, my plan and my, my aim this morning is to uh, help you to have an increased faith uh, in our Almighty God. I hope that that, is, that will be the end. Uh, resolve and in, in, uh, that comes out of this lesson. Um, Brother Andy was kind of trampling all throughout it last last Sunday Sunday morning, so uh, there'll be a lot of things that'll be in, in conjunction with that as well, and as well as uh, Brother Guillermo when he was here uh, talking about all these great characters of faith that that there were uh, that he talked about while while he was with us. So we're going to kind of piggyback off that and um, talk about some things uh, in Second Corinthians chapter thirteen and in verse five. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, to examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Our faith is something that is personal, right? Uh, when I talk about my faith, it's just me. When you talk about your faith, it's just you. And sometimes like, in the, like on the screen there that you might you see, we have an uh, individual that's kind of in a spotlight, and when we do that in connection with talking about our faith, sometimes that makes us a little maybe uncomfortable. And sometimes we need to be uncomfortable when we talk about our faith, uh, possibly. So the Apostle Paul tells us to examine ourselves and to do so quite often, I think, uh, to test yourselves. Is Christ really in us? Is the Lord of glory dwelling within us? And if that's true, then we have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to be ashamed. But he said, if it's not, you are disqualified, meaning that at the end of our days, heaven is not going to be our home. The reward will not be ours if we don't have a faith that will make it until the end. So it's vitally important. Uh, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 22. He said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He says, have a true heart in full assurance of our faith. Something that we have solid within our minds and within our thinking. We have an assurance of faith within our hearts that we'd have no doubts about things in pertaining to to God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us hold fast, he says, the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He says to continue to hold fast what we've professed, what we've confessed. And when we became a Christian, a child of God, and it may go, be way back for some of us, he says we need to still hold fast to that confession of our hope. We had confessed that Jesus was the Lord of our life at one time. And we pledged allegiance to him the rest of our days. He said we need to do that without wavering. For he promised us faithful. If God is faithful, he's telling us we need to be that faithful also. That's saying something, isn't it? He who promises is faithful. If he who promises is faithful, if it is certain that we will have heaven as our home one day because of what God has promised us, then he said we need to have a faith that doesn't waver about that. He said, let us, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. First of all, you have got to have that kind of faith and assurance. And then, once you have it, help somebody else. Help encourage somebody. Stir up one another in, in, lo in love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more th as you see the day approaching. And I realize he's talking about, in this context, probably about the destruction of Jerusalem. But also, when we think about that for us as Christians today, heaven will one day, this life will one day be no more. We will at some point either die or the Lord will return again. And whatever comes first, we need to be ready. Until that day, we need to be doing what we ought to do. We ought to be among God's people when 
the doors are open when the opportunities arise. We need to be doing good every opportunity that we have. We need to be exhorting one another. And so much more. Why? Because we all want to make it to heaven. That's the aim. That's the goal. And he said, if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. And anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He said, of how much more worse punishment do you suppose? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he has, was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. If we sin, after we receive the knowledge of the truth of God, and we go back, we go back into the ways of the world, we sin willfully to a point where we have compromised our faith. He said there only exists a certain fearful expectation of judgment for such a one as that. And so we need to examine ourselves, right, whether we're in the faith or not. And how much worse punishment, he says, do you suppose will be thought worthy of the one who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Well, how has he done that? He's done that because of choices that he made, struggles in his faith, that he chose to look the other way and not think about, have a blind eye to his faith and what he has done spiritually to our Lord. And I want to suggest to you that every time we sin, we forget about that very concept, each and every time. Brother and friends, I've I've done some things that I'm ashamed of. I've done some things that I've regretted in my life. And every time when that has happened, we lose sight of something very, very important. We lose sight of what we have done to to our Lord. We, we, We lose sight of what we have done to the sacrifice that he gave for us. He died for me. And here I am living in sin, going back into the, way, into, the, into the mire. He says, you need to think about that. We all in our life have various things happen sometimes. And I've kind of put this up here as a timeline of our life. We, at one time, we were all living in sin before we were baptized, before we became a child of God. Uh, we were in that situation. And then we became baptized. We were baptized in the body of Christ. We became a child of God. We have hope. We have a different perspective, a different way of life that we have chosen to, 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 to enter into uh, the rest of our days. And sometimes things will happen along our life even after that. Things like I've put on here, like we can have the influence of ungodly friends that, have, that, that touch our lives. And so what do we do with that? We have decisions to make as to how much we will allow them to be an influence on our lives. Sometimes we need to say, you know, we have to go to work and we have to be around certain people. I get that. But there are choices we make about how we, who we spend our time with otherwise. We need to look at that, how that affects our faith. Things can happen like we can lose a job. Happened to me more than one time. (laughs) Trust me. Did not see things happening, just sometimes bad luck, whatever you might want to say about things like that. Um, But we struggle with things financially because of things like that. We might have a death of a family member, a mother we've lost, or a father-in-law we've lost that I wasn't ready to be done with yet. But it happens to us. We all have death. We all have losses. We might have friction in our physical family where they are working against us in our faith, in in holding fast to our profession of our faith. We might even have Christians, family, that we don't see eye to eye on certain things. They might not accept certain things of God's truth that we do accept and we do believe. It creates friction. It creates tension. We might have challenges with some kind of controversial issue that comes up with even within the Lord's church. Things like divorce and remarriage and how we are going to apply God's truth to that. Very, very hard things, brethren and friends. And there are people that have, as I've, I, even when I used to preach, 
They belittled you. They tried to knock down your faith because of say, saying certain things. They said, everybody that believes like you believe, well, we can fit them all in a phone booth. <laughs> well, brother and friends, that just simply is not the case. That's just not true. But we have to stand by what God's word says, no matter what kind of um, opposition we find. And we have to be true to God's word because at the end of the day, whether we've stood for what was right or haven't stand, stood for what was right, we will have to answer for that in judgment. And they will also have to answer for that in judgment, by the way. Maybe you've suffered for the cause of Christ in some way. And we can do that in various ways. No, we have never suffered like maybe the Apostle Paul. And we turn over there sometimes to the Corinthians. We say, look at all the things that he has suffered and faced. And he did. He was, you know, stoned, left for dead. Uh, suffered shipwreck. Have you ever been in a night and a day without the deep? I know I, I haven't. Uh, he, some terrible things. He, he suffered for the cause of Christ. But what was his point in telling us all that? What are we to gather from all of that? Is that no matter what we suffer, no matter what we do for the cause of Christ, it is worth it all. It is worth it all. Paul says, that you can kill me, and I still have my faith to be with the Lord. Remember what he said? He says, for me to die is gain. Do we, do we really get that? But he says, I know you guys want me to stick around a little longer for your sakes. And he understood that principle. We need to also understand that principle. Sometimes we just have some unfair circumstances. Sometimes life just gives us unfair challenges, doesn't it? It really does. And they might be tough challenges that for years we try to overcome them. Years. But we have to stand the test of time. Hang in there. We have to persevere. We might be diagnosed with some kind of terminal illness tomorrow. How will it affect you and your faith? And the answer to all of these things, if you look about all these things on the top and on the bottom, you know what the answer is really? It should not amount a hill of beans to any of it. Why? Because none of it is in direct relation to our faith. It's just things that happen to people. Happen to all of us. You might have a list of things that have happened to you. I may have a list of things that have happened to me in my life. But at the end of the day, it's just stuff. But what we still have, since we were, became a child of God, and what continues on through our life is this timeline of our faith. And will we get to heaven? Will we have made it till the end? As these great characters of faith that was mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, that'll be the test. By faith, they did certain things. By faith, what have you been able to do? What were you able to accomplish? And when you pass away out of this life and your epitaph is written on your stone, what will, it be? what will it say? What will it reflect about your life? That's what's most important. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, he says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. First, I want to talk to you about sometimes people have lost faith in God. The reason many people struggle in their faith is because they have lost faith in God. And we have some unbiblical expectation about life in general. Sometimes they have the, we have the false concept that the Christian life is supposed to, what the Christian life is supposed to look like. We have this unrealistic fantasy that being a Christian solves all of our problems. And with God, we will coast through anything in life that, that he throws our way without any disappointments, any heartbreaks, any pain, and any tragedy. And brethren and friends, that just simply is not true. Just simply is not true. And think about it. This life, if, that, if this life was to be paradise, then God would have made it that way. Well, paradise was lost when sin came into this world, and consequences came as a result of that. And why did God do that? 
because he wanted us to choose him. He wanted us to choose our reward. We all have free will. We all have choices to make. And when we have choices to make and we choose the right thing, should not that be rewarded? And when we choose evil, should not that not, not, not that be punished? In James chapter 1, and verse two and four, verses 2 through 4, he said, My brother, and he says, Count it all joy, James says, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. He says, count it all joy. How do we do that? Well, we do it because we have faith in God. And there are certain things because of our faith in God that we can be joyous about no matter what happens in life, no matter what tragedies we face, no matter what stumbling blocks come in our midst. We can still have the joy of our Lord. We sing about that sometimes. We have the joy of our Lord, right? Right? No one can take that from us. I don't care if you, someone died today in your family and you suffer great loss. It doesn't take away the joy that I have in the Lord. It doesn't take away that. And he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Every time our faith is tested, we struggle. We become better for it, brethren and friends. The brethren that was asking me to put this lesson together, he said, I've looked at your life and he said, it's been a mess. You struggled with various things, various times. But he says, you were an encouragement to me. And at the time, I looked at that, and I'm like, I didn't feel that strong. But he said, what you never did is you never gave up on your faith. He said, you never gave up on God. And that's, that, that's the truth of the matter, brother friends. We can't give up on God. We have to be patient. We have to, no matter how our faith is tested, it must produce patience. <laughs> it brings us low sometimes. And we're, it's good that, that it does that. Let faith, patience have its perfect work, that we may be complete, lacking nothing, he says. That our faith, even though things happen in this life and maybe it gets really bad, our faith is increasing day by day. That's what Paul says. How do we do that? How do we get to that point? It's because we have to work at it, brethren and friends. It doesn't come naturally. Sometimes people are just mad at God. They would start to ask, why, why, why would God do this kind of thing? Why, why would God questions, you know? Such as, you know, why would God allow evil to exist in the first place? Why would God allow suffering? Why would God allow homosexuality to exist in this world? The list can go on and on. You can put whatever, whatever you want, whatever you would like in there. We ever thought about, though, the man Job? You know, if anyone was going to be mad at God because of things that have happened and lost in his life, in one day, do we read in Job chapter 1 what all Job faced in one day? You know, we all face sometimes little adversities here and there, and it can be stretched out throughout our life. Job faced a lot of adversity in one day. And notice what it says in Job chapter 1 and verse 22. At the end of that day, this is what it said. In this, Job did not sin with his lips. <laughs> That's amazing to me. That is amazing to me. Why? Why did he not do that? Nor, he said, no, this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Why did he not do that? Because he still had faith in God, no matter what happened that day. He still had faith in God that he would, that he would be his God. In Job chapter 2 and verse 10, when his wife comes to him and he says, he, they, she, look, they look about all these things that have happened in his life and now he's even touched with boils and all these things in his body and suffering each and every day. She says, why don't you just curse God and die? And he says, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not, and shall we not accept adversity? And he said, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Still, he held to his God. And throughout the rest of the book of Job, we realize, we, we see his thought process. And Job struggled with some things, just like sometimes we struggle with things. And we are not unlike him, by the way. 
And God gives us the book of Job for a very important purpose, brethren and friends. At the very outset of the book of Job, do you remember what God said to Satan? He said, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him, and he walks upright in all the earth? That was what he had in the character of Job. And Satan says, yeah, yeah, but I, he says, let, me, let me have my time with him. He said, I'll, I'll, prove that, I'll prove that to be wrong. But do we remember what happens at the end of the book of Job? In chapter 42... In Job chapter 42, in verses 5 and 6, Job says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. He's talking about God. He said, I've heard of you, but now my eye sees you, and therefore I pour myself and repent in dust and ashes. My eye, how? What eye? The eye of faith, brother and friends, the eye of faith. My eye now sees you, and I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I'm ashamed of what I used to think that I knew, thought about you, God, and how I've challenged you and had thoughts about you that weren't right. If we can keep that mentality through all of our life, we will be humble servants of God all the time, and we will never, ever challenge who he is, and we will always accept who he is and believe in him. And we must not conform to this world's belief system. In Romans chapter 12, and verse 2, Apostle Paul writes for us to do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This world tries to change. is all backwards. But God says, as Christians, we need not to conform to this world's belief system. We need to have something that is different than that. And we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind to prove to people what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? You remember what Job did at the end of his life? Job, he had his friends that came and gave him bad advice. God says, you go and offer sacrifices, Job, for these people because they did not believe in me. But you did. And you were accepted. And they were not. Don't conform to this world's belief system, brethren and friends. And sometimes we just lose faith in God's word, don't we? I think we, so many people just lose faith in God's word. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, he says, So then faith comes by hearing. This is how we get faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And notice he doesn't say that faith comes by listening or just hearing the word of God. He doesn't say that. He says, so then faith comes by hearing. We have to really hear and listen to what God is saying to us and speaking to us. And we have to hear and respect the Word of God. Sometimes it goes in one ear out the other. That's not hearing what the Word of God says. It's like us as parents when we give instruction to our children. Sometimes they listen to what we say, but they don't always do what we ask them to do. Have they really heard us? In the biblical sense, the answer is no. If they heard us, they would obey. The same is true with us as Christians. Our faith, he says, comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. We have to understand that we have to spend time with God's word. It has to become a part of us. And we lose faith in God because we have lost faith in God's word. We have not, we've quit reading it. We've quit abiding it you know, abiding in it and letting it speak to us. In Psalm 119, verse 92, he says, Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction, the psalmist says. If your law had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Things, when it got bad, would have got worse. But because I listened to you and I had your law, they were my delight. It was a comfort to me. You see, we need not to lose faith in God's word. We need not to lose faith in our Christianity, in our walk of faith either. Sometimes we have some past negative experiences with other Christians. And we point fingers at them and say, well, look at that person. They didn't do what was right here. Or they quit attending. They become unfaithful. So what difference is if I do it? 
There is no shortage of things that will distract us in this life. There are, sometimes we will, people will disappoint us. The Apostle Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So Paul then said, okay, I'm just going to quit preaching the gospel. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. It was discouraging to him, but he went on, didn't he? Because at the end of the day, it's his faith. We're not doing it for other people. We want to get to heaven ourselves, and we should. What does the Bible say about all that? First of all, life will be full of faith challenges, won't it? Jesus says, I have spoken to you that, you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He says, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. He says, when you start your walk of faith as a Christian, understand that you're a winner. Why? Because he says, I've already overcome the world. I promise you eternal life. Who else can promise you that? And no matter what this, you might face in this world, you're, with your, Jesus Christ on your side and having faith in him, you will be a winner. In Psalm 34, he says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he said, The Lord delivers them out of, out of them all. God will, God will deliver us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he said, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found a praise to honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've been grieved by various trials, but he said our faith, if it is genuine, he says, and being much more precious than things of this life, than gold, if it is tested by fire, may it be found to praise, to honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes again, what will he find you doing? Will your faith get you there? We have to have a faith that is genuine. That is important to us, and we have to work at it. It has to be our first priority. In Matthew chapter 14, um, we also need to realize that the scriptures tell us that we all struggle with our faith at times. In Matthew chapter 14, Peter said as he was coming out to Jesus, Jesus told him to walk out on the water to him. And Peter looked, you know, as he was coming out of the boat, and he saw that the wind was boisterous, and he was afraid. He began to sink, and he said, Lord, save me. He knew Jesus could do that. He had faith enough to believe that. What he did, though, at the time, because of the elements, because of the day, because of the struggle that he was in, he lost faith in, in what he could do with, God, with the Lord's help. And so Jesus stretched out his hand and said, and he said to him, and he caught him, and he says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? If I tell you to do something, he said, just do it. Believe without doubting. And that's what James tells us. He said, if we ask and we doubt, then we ask in a way that we're not supposed to do that. That's something we, we ought not to do. He said, we're a double-minded man. And don't suppose that we will receive, receive anything from the Lord, he says. But we ought to do it and trust in the Lord when we ask. And even if God doesn't deliver what we exactly ask for, doesn't mean that he isn't listening, and it doesn't mean that he has not stopped listening to us. In, um, in Mark chapter 9, sorry, Mark chapter 9, uh, there was an individual that had the father who comes to Jesus because of the one who had the uh, unclean spirit in, in his child, and he says, and he asked him to save him, but he says, if you believe, Jesus said, all things are possible to him who believes. But this man comes to Jesus and says that if, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, he says. Oh, he should have had faith that Jesus could do anything, right? And that's why Jesus says, that's why he said to, to Jesus, he says, Lord, he says, I believe, help my unbelief. Do we get what he's saying there? I believe that you can do this, he was saying, in one sense, on one level. But he says, I still have unbelief that I struggle with. And maybe, maybe that's us sometimes. 
We need to realize that. We need to examine ourselves and say, what can we do to strengthen our faith? To have more belief in God that we ought to have. In Psalm 94, he said, In the multitude of my anxieties within me, he says, your, your comforts delight my soul. I may have many anxieties in this life, but God's word comforts, he says, my soul. What a great delight. God will always be our help and hope throughout, throughout all of this. We have to realize that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 7, he says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. God, who we don't see, Jesus, who we don't see, is always there. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Abraham was told to leave his land, his home, and to go to a country that God was going to show him. He was going to bless him, make him a great nation, and all that. When Abraham left, he didn't know where he was going. And he couldn't see, really, the end result of the blessings that God promised him. But you know what God, Abraham did? He had faith in God that he would deliver and do all the things that he promised him. No, I'm sorry, got ahead of myself. Um, in Romans chapter five, Romans chapter five, he said, he said, we don't all. Not only that, Paul writes, but we also glory in tribulations. We glory, he says, in tribulations when they happen to us, knowing that the tribulations produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. He says, we, things that we face, we do because it will pervert, produce perseverance and patience within our lives. Understand that. When you suffer, when things happen to you, don't think it's strange. Jesus says, they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Don't think it's strange. But these things produce patience, perseverance, character, and ultimately hope. Hope that no one can take from you. Now he says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I used to read this and miss this whole point. Do you realize what he's saying to us here, brethren and friends? He said, now if we have the hope that will take us to the end and the faith that will take us to the end, it does, does not disappoint. Why? Because God has placed within us a down payment, his only Holy Spirit that was given to us that sets us apart from everybody else. And this one is mine. That one is mine, God says. Because he's ordered his life in a certain way. Have you considered my servant Job? None like him. How about us? Will God say the same thing about us? Does your faith reflect that? In Jude 20 and verse 20 to 23, he says, but, but beloved, he's building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God. We need to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. How do we do that? We do that by prayer. We do that by spending time with God's word. We do that by spending time with God's people. Doing anything that we can to strengthen our spiritual lives and our faith. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. If we don't make to the end, then we haven't arrived yet. Don't. Our faith will not disappoint if we cultivate it right. And so we need to do those things. In conclusion, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4, 16 through 18 there, he says, therefore, do not lose heart. In other words, he's telling us, Paul says also, we might say, don't quit. Don't give up, short of the re or your reward. For even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. It is getting stronger. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Do we realize that everything that happens in our life on that timeline we looked like before doesn't matter a hill of beans? Because our faith is becoming stronger, even though our life on the outside may appear to be in shambles. But he said, it is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, there's those things that we were just talking about, but 
but for the things which are for the things which are seen are temporary and the things which are not seen are eternal you'll get another job now when someone dies you don't get them back but we do have the opportunity to go to the place where they are one day things are temporary but the things we're talking about spiritually with our faith these things are eternal these things matter because they will take us to the end how about you this morning maybe there's do you believe in these things do you believe and have a faith that will take you to the end Paul says in the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 he says finally my brethren be strong steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is never in vain in the Lord you know there's things in this life that we can work at that there's no there's not much reward in as far as that goes in this life it might, it might be very temporary you know all the accomplishments I do in my job eventually I'll be gone one day and someone else will have my job but what we do spiritually matters. God sees it, and we will be rewarded for that. He says, and our labor is never, ever in vain in the Lord. Every time we do something for the Lord, in the work of the Lord, it is always reaping good and benefit, not only in his sight, but also doing good also for the brethren as well. Understand that. You want to do something that matters, do something for the Lord. Appreciate your kind of attention.